This is Kathy Vogan and my colleague Elizabeth Voss, and we are here talking to Andy Worthington, author of The Guantanamo Files, the stories of 774 detainees in America's illegal prison, published by Pluto Press in 2007. In 2011, he worked with WikiLeaks on the Guantanamo detainee assessment briefs release, and in 2020, he was a witness at Julian Assange's extradition hearing. I'll confess I haven't read your book, Andy, but I did read this stunning overview, which I sent you both, and I've highlighted all of the things that really leap out at me. And also, I have read and reread and reread again your second statement for the extradition hearing. And there's a lot ah, okay. of a lot of correspondence between the two. In fact, what seems to emerge, uh, you know, that leaps out at me the most is a profound incompetence and mistaken identities and lawsuits and compensation and disgrace because of the methodology principally that was used and the, the brutality of the American forces as well. And yeah, just the the cruelty um, when they weren't even sure who these men were, and then your comparison as well from what was in the reports about them, it, it must have been fantastic for you to receive the detainee assessment briefs to get so much more their photographs and also what was said about these men, the kinds of teams like the behavioral science teams, the psychiatrists and what they were saying. And then the testimonies, which you had, you had already gone through this in your book, you had talked, and I think in your second chapter about the testimonies of the men themselves and how the two stories just didn't compare at all, that they were cooks, that they were taxi drivers, that they were, rather than being the supposed worst of the worst, they were, in fact, mostly the least of the least. <laughs> yeah, and, it's a good way of putting it, actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know if you've seen my email, but um, I became very well acquainted with David Hicks, who was the Australian detainee for of five course, years yeah. and I interviewed David over a period of nine hours where he told me the whole story from go to woe and we had to stop for breaks because it was too heavy because we needed to eat or have a coffee but it was over nine hours and so he told me about his whole experience there the kind of torture how he got there, he was sold for $5,000 as supposedly a member of or an ally of the Taliban or Al Qaeda. It didn't matter how he was shackled and taken to Guantanamo. Yeah, the methods of torture that were quite individualized. They kind of studied people and discovered what would disturb them pain them the most but you know really the bottom line is how invalid we all know from the torture report how invalid intelligence is obtained under conditions of torture you also say that the witnesses were mostly fellow prisoners who had been tortured into forced confessions and some of these confessions led to enormous events like the invasion of Iraq. Uh, you know, even though they were retracted, still used by George Bush. So um, this incompetence on the one hand that had not only enormous impact on and destroyed individual lives, but destroyed a whole nation, in fact. And finally, <laughs> I just wanted to say that what you have written and also your statement in Julian Assange's extradition hearing 
I just wanted to tell you that it ties in completely with what David Hicks told me, his own personal testimony in great detail. So yeah. what have you got to well, say yeah. now? <laughs> what can you tell us? Uh, take us back to that moment when WikiLeaks contacted you, what you'd been doing up until then, and why? Why they wanted you to work with them on the Guantanamo detainee assessment briefs? Well, so, I mean, I'd started work on Guantanamo um, five years before working with WikiLeaks on the release of the Guantanamo files. And what I'd done was that I'd gone through what the United States government had been obliged to release through freedom of information legislation. And so that was in the spring of 2006. The prison has been open for over four years. It was the first time they told the world who they were holding there. Um, but they also released... Um, unclassified summaries of evidence um, against the men, which, you know, didn't, unlike the files that were released by WikiLeaks, have any information about who had made these allegations. So that's why it was so important that we got these detainee assessment briefs. But regardless of that, you know, they released 8,000 pages of documents. A lot of that was transcripts of the um, what they called the combatant status review tribunals they'd held at Guantanamo, where they um, they were designed to rubber stamp the men's designation on capture as enemy combatants who could be held without charge or trial. So the, this was a completely illegal process. They got the guys in. They said, yeah, you did this, you did that, you did this, you did that. Uh, and the prisoners would go, I don't know what you're talking about. Who said that? Um, no information was provided to the prisoners. They didn't have any legal advice. They weren't allowed lawyers. And so, you know, nearly everyone had their um, initial designation as an enemy combatant rubber stamped by this process. Um, a very small number were recommended for release. So I went through all of this information, which, you know, nothing was made easy. Um, you had to cross-reference as, as to who these prisoners were, because everything in Guantanamo doesn't involve names. It only involves um, ISN numbers, the prisoner numbers, um, of which, you know, David Hicks was right at the start of the numbering system there. Um, yeah. I went through that and, and I was able to draw from an analysis of that who, who it was reasonable to assume these people were. I mean, fundamentally, what I was unable to do was to prove that these men were not captured on the battlefield. Um, no one yeah. was captured on the field, um, except the whole world had been turned into a battlefield after 9-11. But I was able to work out who was captured in Afghanistan. The largest number of people were captured crossing from Afghanistan into Pakistan. I was able to establish the many, many dozens of people who were seized in what appeared to be a phenomenally incompetent house raids for the most part in Pakistan. And then, of course, another group of men who were brought from um, from the various CIA black sites. And what I also crucially did was to assess, partly knowing the context, whether it was reasonable to assume that these men were telling the truth somehow or whether the U.S. government's position um, had anything to recommend it. And I actually think that that, you know, so much of that has stood the test of time that the majority of these men, I mean, hardly anyone um, held in Guantanamo was alleged to have any significant connection to Al-Qaeda. You know, that's the, the absolutely crucial, um, the crucial thing is that, um, is, is that until they brought men from the CIA black sites in September 2006, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and these other guys, who, you know, it's never been proven that these are the people involved in 9-11, but that's what they're alleged. Before these guys arrived, there was really, you know, there was absolutely nobody um, in Guantanamo who held any kind of significant role in Al-Qaeda or any other terrorist organization. And so it was important to try and say, you know, what mistakes did the U.S. make here? How did it, how did it end up in this mess? And of course, what had happened is that it had seized people. Um, it, it had bought, you know, many people for bounty payments. Crucially, they made no effort to establish who they had on the ground. And, and what you actually do in warfare, and especially in any kind of irregular warfare, is you have to have some kind of screening. Have we got the right people? You know, 
in the first Gulf War, for example, the United States did this with people who were, you know, who said, look, you caught me, but actually I'm a farmer. I was traveling through your battlefield and you picked me up. They held these um, reviews, which are part of the Geneva Conventions. And in, two, in three quarters of the cases, they set these men free. They realized they'd caught civilians by mistake. This was in 1991 in Iraq. After 9-11, it was all discarded, along with the Geneva Conventions in their entirety, fundamentally. Mm. And so mm. they were rounding up people who were patently innocent um, and sending them to Guantanamo. And, and essentially, when they got to Guantanamo, they didn't know who they had. And I think this is where one of the particularly disturbing elements comes in, which is that they essentially do what the witch hunters did in the 17th century. And they decide to um, to start torturing them, to get them to tell the truth, what they think is the truth. They think that if they've got somebody there who says they're innocent and is not telling them what they want to hear, that's because they're Al-Qaeda and they're trained to resist interrogation. The truth is the absolute opposite of that, that so many of these men had nothing to tell them because they were nobodies. You know, these were Afghans who had been forcibly recruited to, in the Taliban. They were men from the Middle East and from North Africa who'd gone out to um, Afghanistan. Now, you know, some of those people had gone out there to be missionaries. Some of them had gone out there because they thought the Taliban, you know, had set up a pure Islamic state and that would be a good place for them to live. Clearly, many of these men went out there to help the Taliban fight the Northern Alliance, which was an inter-Muslim civil war taking place before 9-11. And, you know, and as a result, these are people who could have been detained as prisoners of war to be, you know, taken off the battlefield and held unmolested until the end of hostilities. But they, they weren't. The United mm -hmm. States has from the beginning, and it's still really officially the position today that everybody that they captured that was associated with the war on terror um, is somehow um, involved in terrorism. And, you know, that's simply not true. Um, if you're a, you know, if you're a young guy from Saudi Arabia who gets told by your imam to go out and help the Taliban fight the Northern Alliance, then 9-11 happens, then you don't suddenly become a terrorist. But that's the basis of, of, of you know, what's happened at Guantanamo. Mm -hmm. And so all of this work that I'd done essentially, um, you know, fortunately um, put me in a position when Julian and WikiLeaks wanted to release the Guantanamo files, um, they asked me to get involved um, really as a kind of liaison with the major newspapers that were, that were involved to help to explain to them what they should be looking for in the files. Yeah. And, you know, and as I say, the most crucial element of the files was that it put names to allegations so that we were able to um, establish who it was who had been making patently false claims about um, prisoners and you know with some detailed investigation into some of these stories it became mm. clear that you know there were prisoners who repeatedly made allegations against their fellow prisoners saying that they were in Afghanistan doing such and such at a certain time when they weren't even in the country at the time yeah. that could be yeah. demonstrably proved yeah. and, you know and, I'm, and no one would blame people for um, telling lies because of the torture and the other forms of abuse they were subjected to you know, men were bribed with better living conditions to just tell them, shown photos, tell me who this is, tell me what you know about who this is. Um, you know, I'm, I've spoken to people who said, actually, what happened was that, you know, after so many nights of being dragged into the interrogation room in the middle of the night, I just gave up. I just couldn't, I couldn't fight them. They would punish me more. They would bring me into this cell in the middle of the night. Tell, I said, I just started saying yes to everything. And, you know, and I, I know the evidence of the evidence of some of these people is in the files. It's, you know, that's not their fault. Mm -hmm. They just they just gave up at some point and said, I'll, I'll say yes to whatever you put in front of me. Well, of course um, they would. So this was, yeah. you know, what was really important. Yes. Well, uh, you know, Craig Murray tells a very similar story in the context of the torture of Uzbekistani citizens in a black site there that basically that they were they were confessing to all these kinds of things that they had gone to Afghanistan to train with bin Laden 
when that was absolutely impossible because Uzbekistan imprisoned their citizens. There was no way that they could get out of the country. Things, uh, you know, that, that just couldn't be true. Now, I wanted to ask you about something written in your statement. You said the understanding between WikiLeaks, in particular, the person of Julian Assange and myself, was that the confidentiality of the files would be maintained unless and until it was understood and agreed what could and should be published as fully as possible, but without risking damage to persons who could not be protected. So what did you have to do? What did you do to minimize that damage to persons who could not be protected? And there I'm thinking it was probably the people who were still detained there, is that correct? Or, or people who might be pursued? Well, I mean, to be honest, I think that, you know, the main kind of confidentiality issues involved um, involved some of the other files that were released by WikiLeaks rather than the files from Guantanamo, because it was kind of crucial um, that people would would have to be exposed in the Guantanamo files who were prisoners. I mean, the majority um, held at Guantanamo, but some in the black sites. Not mm. because that would attach blame to them, but exactly to expose, um, you know, the necessity of explaining that the, these people's um, supposed evidence was so thoroughly unreliable because they'd been subjected to torture and other forms of abuse. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, particularly, I think that that um, aspect of um, checking things was, was is particularly relevant to some of the other documents that were put out by WikiLeaks. But yes, it's a, it's still, it, it, you know, the, there was some investigation done as well when it comes to the Guantanamo files, and it's a, a um, it was an important aspect of. Um, the submission in, in the sense that, you know, one of the things that the United States government has been trying to establish and failing to do is establishing that, um, you know, that, that people were endangered um, by what Julian and, and WikiLeaks put out there, which, um, you know, which there appears to be no evidence. For. Well, in, in fact, uh, quite the opposite seems to happen. Um, for example, with uh, Abu Zubaydah, uh, who endured 83 waterboardings and finally received 100,000 euros compensation. I think that was to be paid by Poland for his detention. And of course, John Kiriakou, the CIA waterboarding torture whistleblower, also talks about Zubaydah, who wasn't at all who they believe he was. The other person is El Libby who was renditioned to Egypt by the CIA and under torture falsely confessed that Al-Qaeda operatives had met with Saddam Hussein to discuss obtaining chemical and biological weapons. And although I spoke briefly about this earlier, although he retracted his statement, it was used by George Bush to invade Iraq. But the important part of naming these people is to show not only the incompetence, but how they were vindicated in the end and indeed compensated. I don't know if they were really apologised to, though, were they? Well, I mean, for in the case of Ibn al-Sheikh al-Libi, the sad story is that he was eventually, after going through a number of black sites, was returned to Libya, where he was murdered in one of Colonel Gaddafi's prisons. Um, the Libyan story was that he committed suicide, but um, no one really believes that. And I wrote a lot about this at the time. One of the things was that um, I think someone from a human rights organization had actually been allowed into the prison and had spoken to him just before his death. And, um, you know, I wonder if it was the problem there was that he may have been able to tell the truth had he lived. Um, mm. For Abu Zubaydah, of course, he's still at Guantanamo, um, mm. and and you know briefly he was he was seized and very badly wounded in a house raid in Faisalabad in Pakistan um, in mm. March 2002. Um, he was the first victim of the CIA's black site torture program, uh, 
He was waterboarded 83 times. He has suffered immensely as a result of that. They caused him severe problems. I mean, I think um, certainly a few years ago when I heard about him, he was regularly suffering from seizures in Guantanamo as a result of his treatment. Oh. Um, and the United States government has never attempted in court to defend uh, these claims that it made about him from the very beginning. So uh, he's never been charged with a crime. Um, and they've walked back over the years in various cases that have involved um, him in any way. They've walked back from claiming that he was the number three in Al-Qaeda so that that simply doesn't exist. They no longer claim that he had any um, advanced knowledge of the 9-11 attacks, for example. They're left with virtually nothing. I mean, this man worked in a training camp in Afghanistan um, as a facilitator, a camp that had nothing to do with Al Qaeda, and that, in fact, this mm. was Al Libi's camp, and um, you know, and he refused to allow Osama bin Laden to take it over when he wanted to do that. And Abu Zubaydah is still held at Guantanamo without charge or trial. So, what's crucial about that really is that you know there are thirty men held at Guantanamo, and none of these men are being treated in any way that we would find acceptable if we care about the rule of law. They were all stripped of all their rights when they were taken to Guantanamo, and they fundamentally remain without fundamental rights to this day. But 16 of the 30 have been unanimously approved for release by high-level U.S. government review processes, but they're not being freed because President Biden can't be bothered to prioritize that. And he'd have to because there's no legal aspect to these administrative decisions. They can't go to a court. They can't ask a judge to help them. Um, Eleven other men are caught up one way or another, been through or are caught up in the military commission trial process, which is um, a broken system that fundamentally doesn't work. One side, the prosecutors are constantly trying to hide the evidence of torture. The other yeah. side, the defense teams are saying, we can't have anything that, that purports to even look like a fair trial unless we're allowed to expose what happened to our clients. And it goes round and round and round. Yeah. But Abu Zubaydah is one of the three men still held who have never been charged and have never been approved for release. And, um, you know, they... Many years ago, when there were many more of these men, they were called the forever prisoners uh, by the mainstream media, which was uh, very accurate. And so he's now one of the three remaining forever prisoners. What is supposed to happen to men who uh, have never been charged and have never been approved for release? And that the United States, after over 22 years, won't even say, we're not going to charge them, we should let them go. And I think it's very hard not to relate this back to um, a very notorious memo, um, a CIA memo in the early months of Abu Zubaydah's torture, when a message was sent to um, CIA headquarters um, from the Black Knight saying, you know, if he lives through the torture to which we're subjecting him, we want assurances from you. Um, that this man will be held incommunicado for the rest of his life. And, you know, and what's happened with Abu Zubaydah, and it must be said, particularly for the men like him who have never been charged in the military commission, because if you appear in the military commission, some of that gets publicized. There's always been throughout the US government and the different administrations as much of a clampdown as possible on any of the high-value detainees talking freely. But Abu Zubaydah, although he has lawyers, um, and although some stories have come out over the years, there's nothing transparent about the circumstances of his imprisonment. There's, there's no way that any of us could feel, oh, we know something about Abu Zubaydah. He remains hidden by the government that tortured him. And, um, you know, yeah. how incommunicado is he after all these years? And I would suggest that on a scale of naught to 100, it's much nearer the 100th end of incommunicado than it is towards the other end, which would involve transparency. So what you're saying is that their torture continues 
so that they can't tell anybody about it, what happened to them? It, would that be one of the main reasons? Is that why those assurances were sought? Yeah, I mean, it's they're trying to hide the evidence of the torture. That's what this is all about. Oh my um, God. That's why they uh, do everything that they can to restrict the ability of prisoners to speak in any way to the public about what's happened to them. But if I could just say, I mean, it's interesting. Last year, there were a number of opinions by the United Nations Special Rapporteurs. So the Working Group on Arbitrary Detention and then the Special Rapporteur on Protecting Human Rights During Terrorism. I can't remember the exact name, unfortunately, the title. But that was, yeah. that was the first visit by a UN Rapporteur to Guantanamo because previous to Biden, no one had ever allowed the rapporteurs to have the assurances that their meetings with prisoners would be unmonitored. That's a requirement of the special yeah. procedures, um, mm. and they wouldn't do it. But um, absolutely devastating opinions last year about the state of Guantanamo now. The Arbitrary Detention Working Group absolutely categorically described Abu Zubaydah's imprisonment as arbitrary detention. He's never been charged with anything. What's the basis? of his imprisonment, same in the case of another prisoner. And in her extensive report, Pia Nula, the, the special rapporteur who visited, shocked the Biden administration by saying, the totality of factors at Guantanamo, the way that people are still dehumanized routinely, the way they're um, kept under surveillance and moved around in chains, not allowed adequate meetings online with their families, the broken legal aspect of it, she said, this amounts to cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment and may in some cases rise to the level of torture. And this is the prison as it is now, the one that was made slightly less horrible under President Obama, the one that, of course, you know, Trump did nothing um, to improve in any way. And the one that Biden, you know, would like to think is a place where it's not as bad as it was. And she absolutely just cut through all of that and said, no, the fundamental essential structures of Guantanamo, so many of which haven't changed since the early days, mean that it's a massive place of human rights violation. Oh, goodness gracious. Okay, Andy, it's been lovely uh, talking to you. And uh, I haven't let my colleague Elizabeth Voss get a word in, and she has some very important questions to ask you too about uh, slightly different subjects. Um, over to you, Elizabeth. Yeah, I have just a couple of quick questions. One is just tell us a little bit about your involvement with the uh, documentary Outside the Law Stories from Guantanamo. Um, wonderful documentary. I just wanted to, yeah, have you tell us a little bit about your involvement with it. Have you seen it, Elizabeth? Oh yeah, I watched it to prepare for this interview, yeah. Oh, great, okay. I mean, we managed to take that film around quite a lot in the States and in the UK in 2010 and 2011. I worked on it with a filmmaker friend and it was really um, came off the back of the book. It was an attempt to tell in a documentary the story that I tell in the Guantanamo files about why, you know, every aspect of the story of Guantanamo is so horrendous and so lawless. So that was how that came about. And I was fortunate to, I knew Clive Stafford Smith, who's one of the lawyers who appears in it. I met Tom Wilner, who I've worked with ever since in various ways for the film. I also knew Mozan Beg already, but I think the heart of the film is Omar Degay. And it's interesting what Cathy was saying about talking to David Hicks, because Omar had been out of Guantanamo for I think over a year at the time that he agreed to be interviewed. Um, I got to know him and um, he wanted to tell his story for the documentary, but it all came pouring out of him. Um, we filmed him for hours and it was, you know, it was so emotional. And I have heard, you know, from people who work with torture survivors that that can be something that happens. It's kind of like a dam breaks. He clearly hadn't spoken to anyone in that kind of depth until he did for our film. And I was wondering whether Cathy, when she spoke to David, whether David may have been in that situation. But it was hugely moving what he had 
to say about his experiences, which I really thought was the, the heart of the film. And then afterwards, when the film came out, when we took it on tour, I actually, um, you know, I don't drive, but Omar does. And he had a car and we were going around mainly um, Amnesty International groups up and down the country to show the film and then to talk about it afterwards. And so we had these wonderful adventures going up and down the country in this little car, me and Omar, uh, to tell people about Guantanamo and to show the film. Yeah. Yeah, and one thing that came across, you know, as in our discussion already and in the film is um, the way that you go into detail about these detainees really, truly being humanitarian workers, as you said earlier, missionaries, being people who happen to be there for a completely accidental reason, um, nothing to do with terrorism. Even if you're coming from the perspective of, you know, supporting the U.S. intelligence apparatus or whatever, it seems so incompetent and counter to any sort of legitimate intelligence gathering to spend so many resources detaining people who you don't even know who they are. I, that that level of incompetence really is mind boggling. And I think that the comparison you made with the, you know, the witch hunts, I think that really is accurate. I guess, do you think that perhaps after 9-11 that there was just a hysteria and people were just willing to grab anybody to feel like they had made a difference in this new war on terror? Yeah, I mean, I think so. Um, absolutely. I think, you know, I think it would be kind of silly for all of us if we didn't acknowledge that the United States was driven massively by vengeance. And that when you're driven in that way, and when you see that one group of people is allegedly responsible, then you see them all as guilty. You know, I'm presuming that you won't mind me saying that this strikes me as very much what's been happening in Gaza for the last seven and a half months. Um, and actually explicitly stated in terms of some of Israel's leaders and, and prominent people within that society that there are no innocents, that everybody is guilty. You know, one of the crucial things that the United States did, I mean, apart from soldiers, you know, when they were preparing in Afghanistan for capturing people, they were pinning up the Geneva Conventions on the wall, and then they were told that the orders had come that the Geneva Conventions didn't count. So suddenly they're floundering as to like, well, what do we do then when we bring people into custody? And, you know, and that's where the loosening began. That's where the, um, the crossing the lines began because the, because the Bush administration tore up and threw out every aspect of domestic and international laws and treaties regarding how you treat people who are deprived of their liberty. That's the fundamental origin of Guantanamo, and that's why it remains so horrific today that fundamentally the men held there still don't have rights that they should have. But, you know, it's, I, when I was researching Guantanamo, I came across a book which was written by an interrogator who had worked in Afghanistan, U.S., a uh, military interrogator who had worked in Afghanistan. He wrote a book under a pseudonym. Um, he worked with a well-known U.S. journalist. And it came out, you know, quite in quite early days of uh, this whole story. And he explained in there that every single Arab prisoner that ended up in their custody, the orders were that they all had to be sent to Guantanamo. Now, they were on the ground there, not doing proper screening because that wasn't their job. Um, but, you know, they're, they're interrogating people and finding things out and aware that um, they're sending people to Guantanamo that they don't think were guilty of anything. People who were out in um, Afghanistan or Pakistan for reasons that weren't connected with any kind of militancy, let alone any kind of terrorism. And yet they're having to send them there because every prisoner list that they had had to be sent out to the high command who was sitting out in Doha um, looking at the lists and um, you know they found out that what happened with Afghans who were coming into their custody was that you know vast numbers of wrongly detained people were coming into their custody and he said what they worked out how to do eventually was how to keep them off the books for a couple of weeks so that they could you know free the patently innocent people who had come into their custody, um, which they did. And if you look at the numbers, the ISN, the prisoner numbers from Guantanamo, in the later 
um, arrivals, you start noticing these big gaps in the numbers. And that's because of what they were doing. They were sending, um, they found a way to bypass these ridiculous rules that were laid down that was fundamentally requiring that everyone got sent to Guantanamo. And if you think that what went along with that is that they don't know anything about these people, but they think that they're all guilty, that's, that, you know, it's really important, I think, for all of us to remember that's why it got so horrific. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I hope that that helps. Yeah, no, it definitely does. And it seems like, you know, a real symbol of the way in which the war in Afghanistan and la later on in Iraq were just kind of doomed to fail, um, that there was just such in such incompetence and uh, impunity in the way that it was conducted that was counter to its own goals to an extent. Absolutely. I mean, I have got I've got one particular anecdote that always struck me as so important on this front. Um, and it's a, it's an Afghan prisoner um, who was um, significant in his local tribal area. Um, and he was captured and taken to Guantanamo. I think the night that he was captured and taken to Guantanamo with two other people, one of the people who was there was because he was involved in dogfighting, which, you know, this isn't about whether or not dogfighting is a good thing or bad. The Taliban hated dogfighting. So the fact that he was involved in it was an immediate, should have been an immediate acknowledgement that this man had nothing to do with the Taliban. But he's this tribal leader. They took him to Guantanamo. And in the transcripts of the tribunals that I was talking about, which was the, you know, the basis of my research, because uh, these were translations of what people had said often English wasn't their first language in most cases they were they were broken documents in the sense that who knew whether the translators were any good but amazingly sometimes the stories of these prisoners would leap out at me um, as to who they were and he said he said look he said look guys the thing is I don't mind being here you know I'm I'm a I'm getting on in years. I can, you know, I can find a way to put up with your prison here. But the problem is I have six sons in Afghanistan and they're not happy about me being here. And I have an extended family. And he went on and on with the story of the impact of his wrong detention. And suddenly you had an entire province in Afghanistan that the United States had lost because they didn't care that they had the wrong person. But, you know, this was losing hearts and minds on an absolutely colossal scale. And it was really through that that I realized that, um, that in all of the conflicts that have taken place in the 21st century in the United States that we should... Uh, I mean, look at the scale of the injustice of what took place in Iraq and the prisons there. Um, any notion that we should presume any kind of accuracy on the part of U.S. intelligence is a really foolish route to take because, um, because they so persistently have demonstrated and the evidence is there from Guantanamo that they don't know what they're doing and they don't care and that the damage that causes to the people that they're supposedly helping um, is is almost incalculable, actually. Yeah, it's horrific. Kathy, I didn't know if you wanted to come back in and talk a little bit about, about your very long interview that you mentioned earlier. Um, yes, that's exactly what I'd like to talk about and uh, then finish up with just one more question. Well, perhaps, uh, I don't know if you know uh, Andy, about uh, how David Hicks got out of Guantanamo, what he was forced to do, and then what subsequently happened, um, which is sort of a happy ending in a way. Um, do you know much about that? Um, what happened to Hicks after Guantanamo? Yeah, I do. It's going back a long time now as to, um, you know, obviously his book and, uh, you know, I yeah i was in communication with david for a little bit back then yeah well i just wanted to tell you because i interviewed david uh 
back then it was in 2012 and we we spoke for nine hours and then much more recently i interviewed his lawyer stephen kenny who is also julian assange's lawyer now and of course what happened to david which i knew already was that he accepted a plea deal and it was an alfred plea in which he was forced to confess sign all of these documents that he had committed all of these acts that he was not guilty of at all but if he didn't sign everything and say yes i did this yes i did that in order to justify his incarceration for five years he wasn't coming back to australia and the australian government was complicit in that as well it was the government of john howard at the time but what's even more ridiculous i suppose absurd about it and shocking in a way is that uh, well, in 2015, Stephen Kenny succeeded in clearing David's name. And he told me about what the plan was to initially get him out of Guantanamo. And Kenny went looking for any offence that David had committed in Australia in order to be able to request his presence in Australia so that he could be tried for crimes in his country of citizenship right and so he went looking searching 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 and and kenny said that the worst thing he found was david had not registered his dog that was it that was the height of it now how how he actually cleared david's name was because of what he was charged with he had been charged a couple of times and initially those charges just didn't hold water like aiding the enemy but in the end the one that stuck was offering material aid to terrorism and kenny found that at the time that he was charged that that was a non-existent offense they had actually invented the offense with which to charge david and so under American law, and that would be the Fifth Amendment, and also, as it happens, and that this is somewhat relevant to the case of Julian Assange, Article 7 of the European Convention on Human Rights, both say that you can't be charged retrospectively for something, even though that charge did come into existence. At the time that Hicks was charged with it, it just didn't exist. And so the case, it was annulled. And so David emerged from all of that. He came back to Australia as a convicted criminal under duress due to confessions that he was forced to make. But he emerged out of all that with no criminal record whatsoever. Now, the last question I want to ask you, because you've been talking about what these people have to reveal, what they would be able to reveal, well, if they're still intact, if they haven't been turned into zombies with so much solitary confinement, torture and the like, what they would be able to reveal even more detail on this incompetence and somehow this almost unacceptable reality that the reason that they are being further detained, indefinitely detained and never charged, part of that is because of the stories that they may have to tell. I wonder if that makes you think in a way about this almost endless detention of Julian Assange, what he would have to say. Well, I would say that although the circumstances are different, um, the intent is the same. And what I mean by that, Cathy, is that Julian is caught, like many people before him, fighting the US-UK extradition treaty of 2003, which is not fit for purpose. But what it means is that if you get caught up in it, then you can expect to be held while you challenge it 
for six years, for eight years, even longer in the cases of some people who ended up being extradited to the United States. Mm. The point is that although there's a process in place here which is different from the completely lawless basis on which the United States declared people to be enemy combatants without rights, what it mm. does is, um, is it, it, it means the United States is subjecting people to um, an intolerable, lawless and long imprisonment. Um, yeah. So it's done it in different ways, but the intent is the same. The yeah. United States government and the British government want Julian Assange to suffer. I'm not convinced that they actually want this to go to trial in the United States because this is such a crucial case for the First Amendment in the United States. But as long as he's caught fighting it, they deprive him of his liberty. They make him suffer. He's stuck yeah. in Belmarsh, the poor man. And I do see it as very similar to the situation that men are held in England and were low. Well, the other thing is that we have learned that this ruling by Justice Kavanaugh in the Supreme Court in June 2020 highlighted a matter of long established US law that people who were foreign nationals who had acted abroad had absolutely no constitutional rights under trial in the United States. Do you think they built Guantanamo Bay where it is outside of the jurisdiction. So they would have no rights. Well, they established it so that they would have no rights. Their intention was to prevent any US lawyers or judges from having any say over what they were doing there, which, you know, mm. um, which explains that from the beginning they were intending to abuse people there. What's happened in uh, the time since then um, and Justice Kavanaugh, who, you know, really should never have been given that job, and who was also responsible for some terrible, um, it was involved in some of the terrible rulings that, in the end, almost entirely successfully stripped the Guantanamo prisoners of habeas corpus rights that they fought for for years. But what he's trying to suggest is that their claims that foreigners have no rights, he, he's kind of flipping it to going after foreigners who don't have rights. So the whole thing about Guantanamo has been, these are foreign nationals and therefore no rights apply to them. That isn't a, a correct interpretation of the law. They're playing games with removing people from any of the protections that they should have when the mm. United States is involved in uh, dealing with them. They're trying to create a pattern of lawlessness for everybody, um, which, you know, at Guantanamo, they never successfully did it with U.S. citizens. I don't know whether you know, but they um, had one U.S. citizen at Guantanamo, and they, when they found out, they freaked out and got him out of there. They also held a number of one U.S. citizen and a number of U.S. residents um, in Guantanamo black site conditions on the U.S. mainland, um, mm -hmm. but they never wanted to challenge that in the courts. They ran scared when they, when they were challenged on that. Um, but it's very important that, as we're seeing with Julian, and I mean, I think we're seeing this in the case now, um, yeah. attempts to extradite him and to not even accept that if he's going to be put on trial in the United States, he should have First Amendment rights. I mean, what's going on here? You know, they want him in the United States and then they want him to have no rights. Um, you mm. can't have both. Well, it's not as simple as all that because foreign nationals who acted within the United States jurisdiction may have constitutional rights. And of course, United States citizens have their rights anywhere in the world, wherever they act. It is this combination of being a foreign national and acting abroad, committing alleged offenses abroad. It's the two combined that make for no rights, which is exactly the situation of Julian Assange, and I guess as well, uh, yeah, which, which, most you know, which fundamentally should and... make for no for no case, you know. Yeah, um, mm. I mean, you know, back in um, in the two thousands and the two thousand and tens, there was the case of two British Muslims 
um, who were accused of running a terrorism website. And the, the only reason the United States um, could call for their extradition <clears throat> because one of the servers for their website was located in Connecticut. So they spent between six and eight years fighting their extradition to the United States. And when they got to the United States and eventually were put on trial, one of them was immediately sent home for time served and the other one got a small sentence and then was also sent home. Um, yeah. But mm. that whole scenario of a server being located in Connecticut should never have happened. If the crimes that these men were accused of, then they should have been prosecuted in the United Kingdom. Um, but yep. the United Kingdom had never deemed that there was a case to answer. And so Julian is again suffering from this either rejection of territoriality or a false approach to territoriality. You know, you was in the United <laughs> yeah, States. Yeah. Nothing about the work that it's reckon? involved. <laughs> involved you know. Yeah. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. I really appreciate your time. Yes. Thank you. We'll see you soon. See you soon. Yeah, see thank you. you. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate being able to talk. Bye.